All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to AFN 128 and ANT 128, uh, Black Women in Africa and the Americas. Um, you know, it's a, you know, this course is an Afro-American studies Black, uh, you know, Black women course. And at the same time is an Anthropology 128 course. So we have um, a diverse set of students um, registered in this class uh, from all walks of life and, uh, you know, different academic um, interests and also uh, backgrounds. And uh, previously we've discussed um, the myth of the black woman. We've discussed the perspectives of how black women are viewed, um, you know, around the world, um, especially maybe in the US or in the Caribbean or places in Africa. And today joining us, we have the pleasure of uh, Professor uh, Victoria Yemisi Oyekami visiting from um, Omaha, Nebraska. Um, she's a professor of uh, professor of geography, and uh, she's going to be talking to us today about women in prehistoric um, Africa, uh, women in traditional societies in Africa before European uh, contact. And she has some other good stuff. Um, that she'll be discussing with us today. Um, she has previously been a guest speaker in my History of African Civilizations, where you know, she discussed the role of um, women in prehistoric Africa. And um, we look forward to hearing from her today. Without further ado, um, let me first introduce you to my students, um, Jennifer Harvey, Liddell, uh, Narin, Z Rivera, Mouse, and Aliyah. Other students may be joining us, um, you know, during the course of the um, time allotted for this class today. Uh, we were actually supposed to meet face to face today, but I did cancel because of the guest speaker. So thank you so much to everyone that um, has joined us. And I would like to present uh, Professor uh, Victoria Oyekami visiting from um, Metro Community College in Omaha, Nebraska. Let's give her a round of the round of applause. Thank you all. Good afternoon. So again, I'm Victoria Alapo. I know she's using my married name, which is fine. Uh, I just uh, so usually I use the short form of my name to help everyone pronounce it easier. And so, yes, I live in Omaha, Nebraska. I teach at the Metro Community College there. I teach geography full time. And uh, you'll be interested to know that geography is very much related to history. And so uh, the, the class that you're taking, we, we can also say that's a, a branch of geography in a way. So, so I'll be very, I'm very pleased to be in your class today. And thank you for having me today. Thank you for inviting me, Professor Alapo, Professor Remy, who is also my sister. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I do okay, want to so... get the students confused because okay. my name is Remy Alapo and hers yes. is Yemi Alapo. <laughs> exactly, exactly. All right. So um, do I have the host um, so I can show Oh, yes. Yeah. So let me um, give you host status. Okay. Sorry about that. No, no, no worries. Okay. You're good to go. Okay. All right. Just a second. Okay. Can everyone see the PowerPoint on the screen? Yes. Okay. Good. All right. I'll make, I'll maximize it then. Okay. So uh, the title of today's uh, presentation is The Power of, of Women and the Nature and Influence of Gender Roles in Pre-Colonial Africa. So uh, I thought this would be a very good uh, topic to present since your class is about women's uh, issues, especially in the diaspora. And I know I'll be talking a lot about pre-colonial African women, but then of course we, re we recognize that we will not have a diaspora if there wasn't an Africa first. And so that is why we, we like to start from there sometimes. So I'll begin right here on the PowerPoint. You will notice that a lot of African women prehistoric uh, 
pre-colonial, sorry, not prehistoric, pre-colonial before Europeans uh, were considered uh, maybe in Western minds as weak or people with no rights because you hear a lot of people say, oh, women have no rights in, in Africa, but actually that's a misnomer. Uh, women had a lot of rights in Africa and I'm going to show that today in this, this presentation. So the reverse was true. In fact, it says right here, uh, a lot of pre-colonial uh, women uh, had more rights than European women during the same time period. For examples, I'm using examples now. <clears throat> Women in England could, uh, well, women could not be uh, monarchs in England until about the 1500s or, or thereabout. And so that, that's considered rather uh, recent for Africans because, uh, and I know 1500s is old, but now you have to realize uh, human recorded history goes into thousands and thousands of years. <clears throat> excuse me, uh, Egyptians, for instance, have had que queens, monarchs who were female for thousands of years. And so when we hear in Africa that, oh, England was still arguing about having a woman who was a queen uh, in the 1500s, that's for us uh, kind of laughable actually. So um, next, right here, I, I explained that even in more recent times, women could not vote in Western countries like the United States and the UK until the 20th century. In fact, specifically until 1920, almost, uh, okay, so 100 years, 101 years ago, which is again, very recent in human history. Uh, contrary to what we had in the African situation a long time ago, where again, you had sovereigns, women who could rule in their own rights before women were even allowed in a lot of European kingdoms as uh, monarchs, full monarchs. Now, having said that, um, equality in women's rights were not the same across the board all over the continent because obviously we had some um, Islamic parts of the continent, we had parts that had traditional religion, and we even had parts that had Christian religion like in Ethiopia. So I don't want you to think women's rights were exactly the same even in pre-colonial times before Europeans. However, the rights were much stronger in pre-colonial times than we had after the Europeans appeared in the continent. And so it says right here, even though pre-colonial inequality existed in the control of resources, women still had a greater access uh, to, uh, to, to farming, for instance, to lands, to power, to a voice and so on and so forth. And so there were, and the reason for this is because there were parallel male and female authority structures that helped to protect women's interests. And I used examples where, of course, we've already talked about people who could rule in their own rights, uh, uh, Nefertiri, uh, Cleopatra, you know, you even have uh, Kandakes in uh, Kush, in the empire of Kush, you have queens who are called Kandakes. And then of course you have people in Ethiopia themselves who were queens, the queen of Sheba. Um, actually, contrary to what some people may think, uh, the Queen of Sheba was a real human. <laughs> she was not a fable uh, because she appears in the Old Testament book of uh, 1 Kings chapter 10. And so many people assume that because she is uh, a woman, an authority figure that appears in the Old Testament of the Bible, that, oh, she may be made up. No, she's actually not made up. I've done research into uh, the particular person called the Queen of Sheba, and we have found that she actually Actually did exist about 3,000 years ago. So she was a queen in a place called Sheba, which today will be considered Ethiopia today. All right. So, um, and now in, in Nigeria, where I'm originally from, there were people we called um, Iyalo days, right here, Iyalo day. Iya means mother, Ode means outside. So Iyalo day means the mother who works outside outside of the home. And uh, yellow days were very, very powerful women appointed by the, the, the king. Usually the king would have male ministers, you know, like today you'll have the secre secretary of, uh, what's it called, agriculture and so on and so forth. Back in those days, they called them ministers. They would say, not. I'm not talking about church ministers. I mean like your, you know, secretary, secretary of the defense or something. 
So in those days, they will call them uh, king's ministers. And in fact, there used to be in Yoruba land, in Africa, in Nigeria specifically, there used to be at least one woman. And that woman was called the Iyalode. Iyalode would be the queen, I mean, sorry, the king's female minister who actually oversaw the rights of women in the kingdom. And so, yes, women did have a voice in pre-colonial uh, systems, even where the men were the kings. They made sure there was a woman minister who at least had the affairs of women brought before the king in the palace every single day. So there was never a time when women did not have a voice in pre-colonial Africa, either as queens themselves or at least as ministers of the king. And then we have uh, situations where um, examples of other uh, queens in uh, pre-colonial Africa have uh, mentioned Cleopatra and uh, no, no, the famous ones you already know. But what about people like Hatshepsut, one of my favorite queens in Egypt, actually, who act was the first queen of Egypt to, to rule as a male. <laughs> Even though she was a woman, she was given the full authority of a man. And so when she was queen, guess what? They called her King Hashepsut. <laughs> because because in, in, that, in that time during her period when she lived, Egypt had had men. And so she was one of the first women ever to become queen. This was way before Cleopatra, way, way, way before. So it, it was a, a surprise to have a woman. And so I guess at that time, so early on, instead of calling her queen, which was the wife of a king, they decided, well, she's a king. So we're just gonna call her King Hatshepsut. <laughs> so she was the first queen king of Egypt. <laughs> So uh, when I went to Egypt a few years ago, it was it was wonderful to see uh, where she's buried. In fact, she's the only woman buried in the Valley of the Kings because she was considered a king. So there it is. We had women rulers way back. And I can say cate categorically that uh, King, king Queen Hatshepsut was, uh, was, was one of our very first uh, feminists worldwide. She was one of the ones who broke the mold uh, for women leaders worldwide, you know, to give an example of how it can be uh, as a woman leader. She was very good. She was a very good leader. In fact, uh, many pre-colonial queens have tend to, tended to be very good leaders of their kingdoms. Now here on this map, you'll see uh, a brief map of uh, many kingdoms in pre-colonial Africa that existed before Europeans. Now, obviously it doesn't show uh, Egypt in the North, which will be uh, in North Africa, because this specific map shows Sub-Saharan Africa. And I, I do agree with you if you're thinking, why doesn't it show Europe? I mean, sorry, uh, Egypt, sorry, I meant Egypt. Well, a lot of the uh, geographical maps that are in our textbooks, I'm not sure exactly why they tend to focus more on Sub-Saharan Africa, because when they do, uh, unless you get, unless you're able to, and they're very rare, which is weird. They usually cut off the north of Africa separately and then they have sub-Saharan Africa. So you'll have to show two different maps to show Egypt, and then you'll have to show the rest of the continent, which I do agree is it's, I think it's not normal. It's actually not correct in my view, uh, because I feel this is their way of cutting off Egypt from Africa's civilization. Because for a long time, uh, racist academics in the West have claimed that Egypt wasn't even part of Africa. That somebody else built it, which we all know is a lie. It was built by Africans. And so you'll notice a lot of maps actually don't show Egypt because they like to lump it in with the Middle East or somewhere else. And so, but I am saying here in today's presentation that Egypt is included in today's presentation. I just couldn't get a map that showed every kingdom at once. I, I'm sure I could <laughs> do a lot of research to find such a map. I'm sure they do exist, but they're harder to find than the ones that are cut off in, in, in two. All right, so um, some of the kingdoms we've talked about is Kush, the queen of Kush. We talked about the Kandakes. Here is Ethiopia. Now, the, the thing about Ethiopia is that 
some of the older kingdoms were called Kush and then Nubia, and then the, the center of the kingdom moved south a little bit, and then it's, it was called Ethiopia later on. Uh, also, also, you have Ghana, you have Mali, uh, and then you have Angola. Okay, so back then it was called Angola, and there was a place also called Congo. A lot of these um, kingdoms actually had women, or at least matrilineal empires where women was the, you, you counted your lineage through your mom, not through your dad. And so a lot of these were women headed kingdoms. So, and then we've already mentioned her, the queen of Sheba. Uh, the, there's something written about her from, from about uh, 1000 BC. So that's 3000 years ago. And then there's another queen called the Kendake who is also mentioned in the New Testament. And that's also an African queen from Cush in Acts chapter eight, uh, written about 60 AD. Now, I'll show you other aspects of women in Africa, especially the ones who were warrior queens. I'm sure you've heard about warrior queens. Actually, they did exist. They were not fables at all. In fact, a lot of them commanded entire ar armies and they were involved in whole warfare. In fact, roles that were considered male in Europe. So our example, uh, one of the very first warrior queens in Africa was Amanirenas. And Amanirenas was the queen of Kush. Remember Kush, this kingdom up here? She was the queen of Kush. And uh, she was one of those very powerful and very, very, uh, very good queens, by the way. Now, Rome, uh, the mistake Rome made was that they tried to take her kingdom over. <laughs> well, that was a big mistake. Uh, she, she led a war against Rome back then. So from 27 BC before Christ to uh, 22 BC. And in fact, she won. She won in that war to the point where, I'm not sure how she did it, but she was able to capture the, the head, the bust, the statue of the king, what's his name? Uh, in Rome then, the kings were called uh, Caesar, Caesar Augustus. And so she was able to capture maybe from the armies of Rome, the bust or the, the head, the, the statue of Caesar Augustus. Guess what she did with it? She put it under the, the, the step, the threshold of her temple so that every time people walked into the temple to pray, they stepped on his head. <laughs> And so that head was only recently dis discovered like a hundred years ago. It, it was buried under the temple in Kush, in Kush for thousands of years. And uh, archaeologists have had just, when I say recently, I mean within the past 100 years, discovered that statue buried under the temple. Now they knew the story had happened, the war had happened, but it was the first time they actually saw evidence of it. <laughs> of how well she, she was able to command her armies. Well, long story short, short, after she won that war against Rome, I mean, we're talking about Rome now. Rome was the world power before Christ. I mean, they conquered everywhere. If you have read the New Testament, actually the very first books of the New Testament show that the Romans were in power because even Jews had to pay taxes to Caesar. And so you, you find that the Roman Empire was so vast and so powerful. And here was a woman, an African woman, a black woman, oh, a one-eyed queen. <laughs> Maybe I'm not sure how she lost her eye. Maybe in another battle or I don't know what happened, but she was a one-eyed queen and won against the armies of Caesar Augustus. And come, come to find out, Whatever she did in that particular war created a treaty, an agreement between Rome and Kush that lasted 300 years. Basically, she was able to broker peace with the Roman Empire for them to never enter Kush ever again. And so, yeah, they, they kept that promise. They were like, oh, yes, ma'am, we're not coming back. <laughs> and so, no, they never went back to Kush after that. That was awesome. Another queen I love in uh, Africa is actually a Nigerian. Yay, go figure, right? Queen Amina of Zaria lived in the 1500s to the 16th. 
1600s. And actually, uh, as you can see here from some of the official stamps that were collected uh, in Nigeria, uh, now put online by somebody else, obviously, uh, she was a warrior queen. You can see her on horseback with the, you know, the spear. And so a lot of these um, pre-colonial uh, women were involved in activities that in Europe would be considered male. Uh, they did not mind actually getting their, their hands dirty in war. And so she was one of the ones who fought for freedom in the northern part of Africa back then when uh, the Muslims were coming in. So here's another queen in Zinga of Angola. Wow, I love her. Um, now, Angola, remember I've shown you on the previous map, Angola is in the in the southwest of Africa right here. So it used to be called Ingola, but today it's called Angola. And so an A has been added to the, to the word. So it's now Angola. So she was in Zinga of Angola. Uh, in Zinga was a very powerful woman. In fact, she also lived in the 1500s, right about the time when slavery was going. And she decided, no, my people are not, not going to be slaves, not mine, maybe somebody else's, but not here in Angola. <laughs> and the Portuguese fought so hard to, to get people you know, to be taken forcibly from Angola and she wouldn't let them. She actually got on horseback and con commanded entire armies to stop the Portuguese. And so she fought with, you know, spears and knives and swords. And uh, so she fought the entire time she was queen. Unfortunately, she had to fight off the Portuguese to keep her people safe and she was successful. Unfortunately, after she died, um, the, the men who took over from her were weaker. I'm talking about politically. And uh, unfortunately, the story goes that um, slavery then commenced in Angola after that. Uh, but during her time, not on her watch though, no slave was taken from Angola during her watch. And the black people in Angola remained free the entire time she was queen. So that's a, a great story there. Uh, this is also one of my favorite, I have so many favorite, favorite warrior queens in Africa because this is one woman very close to the modern era. She was actually not a, a full sovereign because her son was the king, but she was his mother. <laughs> I'm laughing because I'm, I'm, I can see the story rolling in my, in my head right now because I went to Ghana in 2013 with some students from our campus, from our university, you know, and um, we went to the palace, this uh, palace of the king at the time who was, well, he's no longer, obviously that's a long time ago, over a hundred years ago. So the British, the British were coming to take over Ghana. It was called the Ashanti Empire at the time. And the guys, the ministers, the, the, ma the men in charge, they were not really putting up much of a fight and she got mad <laughs> and she said, Okay, guys, if you're not going to fight the British, I'm going to do it. And I'm going to get armies to do it for you all. So she actually, she was not joking. She actually went and put on ceremonial warrior dress because what you, sorry, what you see her wearing in this photograph is actually ceremonial warrior dress. This is what men wore to war. This is what they put on to go to war. So it's called, a, I know it's a big name. It's a full full mouthful. <laughs> it's a batar, batakari kese. And it, it basically it's Ghanaian for war dress. Well, there she was. And she stood there in front of the British with a gun saying, you all are not gonna come into this palace to take over from my son. You're gonna have to go through me first. <laughs> well, she wasn't kidding. She wasn't joking. She actually had an, uh, an entire army behind her. The men, when they saw how determined she was, the, the, the armies, the men actually followed and they also took up their own weapons and followed her to keep the British, the British away. They fought and they fought and they fought. She was able to, stay, to stave off the British for a long time, but I'm sorry to say that eventually the British won. They didn't kill her and they did not kill her son, the king. However, they exiled him into another country. And so they did take over the Ashanti kingdom and it became the Gold Coast. That's what the British began. They began to call Ghana the Gold Coast because they found gold there. So it's kind of a, a bittersweet story because 
yes, she put up a fight to show how strong pre-colonial women were. However, because the colonial people coming from Europe had better weapons, they were able to get their way and take over her son's kingdom. Uh, but at least she did not take it lying down. That's the story. She did not, she did not take colonization from the British lying down down you know and that that's a story that ought and that needs to be told and so and now this woman here she actually is coming more recent into our time as you can see here um she reigned well with her husband she wasn't a full queen her husband um menelik the second was the king of ethiopia during this time between 1889 to 1913 uh but she actually was very important why because Another story of war. The Italians were about to take over Ethiopia. And she's going like, really? Another, another invasion? So, okay, so I didn't tell you this uh, story from the beginning. The African, um, it was called the Berlin Conference. Basi basically in 1884, Europeans met at, at, uh, at Berlin to decide to take over the entire continent of Africa. And so what happened was, well, as they were taking over all the kingdoms in Africa, remember the Ashanti Empire and all of them, they stopped at Ethiopia and did not take Ethiopia. They just decided, okay, we're not gonna take Ethiopia. Well, you guys are thinking, why? Well, the reason is Ethiopia was already Christianized for 2000 years. And since the excuse they used to take over the rest of us in Africa, was that we didn't know the Lord, well, that excuse wouldn't have flown in Ethiopia because Ethiopia has already been Christianized for 2000 years. So you can't take a place that is already Christian is your, if your excuse is that you're taking all the heathens, right? All the, the people living in the dark. <laughs> you can't do that for Ethiopia. So they left Ethiopia. Come to find out, well, the, the, so that was in 1884. Well, in 1896, you see this battle of Adwa right here. The Italians, after the Berlin conference was already over in 1884 and all the Ethiopia, I mean, Europeans had already taken all the land they wanted except for Ethiopia. Well, the Italians decided, hey, why are we leaving, leaving this uh, place alone? Uh, I mean, this was, <laughs> this was like 12 years after everybody was already done and we were done and we, nobody was talking about colonizing anybody anymore. It, it, Italy said, well, we're going to go back and take that empty spot you guys didn't take. I mean, why, why are you leaving them free when everybody else is taken? So it, Italy actually went to, to Ethiopia to try to take it in 1896. Well, the queen said, not on my watch. <laughs> Even though her husband, King Melanick, was the emperor, but the empress said, no, you're not taking it. You, you are not taking this. And so she actually, right here, she amassed a battalion of 5,000 soldiers. <laughs> she, she actually commanded a battalion of 5,000 soldiers and she actually got into army uniform and got on a horse and she started fighting along with the soldiers. Well, they actually won that fight, yay! I'm, I'm happy to, I'm actually happy to say that particular war actually was won by Ethiopia and the uh, women and the men who fought along with uh, Queen or Empress Betul back then. So there you go. Uh, she personally took command of the Ethiopian army against the Italians. And in fact, historians have estimated that between 20,000 to 30,000 women participated in the campaign. That means the war of Adwa. Even the ones who were not on horseback were doing significant work as soldiers in other capacities. They were strategists looking at maps of, of how to invade and, I mean, sorry, on how to defend against the Italian invasion. A lot of them were advisors, translators. They could translate, they could speak Italian. A lot of them were intelligence officers, spies, <laughs> women spies. <laughs> and so women were routinely doing what you would consider male, like male work uh, back in those days. So it, it was awesome. So she got to keep, or they got to keep Ethiopia free because of her 
because of her stand saying that they would not have that uh, country. Another thing that is uh, important was that even the capital city of Ethiopia today, Addis Ababa, right here, uh, Addis Ababa was chosen. The location was chosen by the queen. So uh, she named it New Flower, and that's what Addis Ababa means in uh, Amharic, in, in Ethiopian language. So uh, she named it, she chose the site, and so even the capital today that we use till right now, 2021, was chosen by the queen of, uh, of Ethiopia back in the 1800s. So that's awesome. A lot of wonderful history right there of powerful women. Now, let's go a little bit to uh, women who actually lived in historic, I mean, sorry, in Islamic places like Mali. Because I know sometimes people would say, oh, well, what about the women who lived in Islamic places who couldn't be full queens? Well, they were not left out either. It says right here, African women did not have to cover their faces. In fact, I'm, I'm quoting uh, specific authors here because I've, I've read them and I've seen them myself. I mean, African women, because I'm from Africa. I've seen Muslim African women. They might cover their head and wear a hijab, but usually I'm talking about traditional pre-colonial African women were not forced to cover their faces like you might see in Afghanistan or in parts of the Middle East. And in fact, many women could decide whom they would marry and divorce, which is very unlikely in many parts of uh, pre-colonial Middle Eastern places in Africa, we could do that. In fact, women could serve as griots. Griots means people who kept official records for the king. Women could do that in Islamic Mali, see? And that's in a Muslim country. Now, so again, even though women did not become queens in their own right in places like Mali because of Islam, however, they still had very powerful voices as the mother of the king. So uh, they were king, uh, queen mothers, and also they served as mediums and spiritists who gave advice to the king. Now let's go to the economy a little bit. Uh, market women, oh, women dominated the market, that's for sure. Even till today in Africa, women are the, the big people you will see in the marketplace. Yes, you get some men who, who sell things as well, but usually it's the women. In fact, it, uh, the, the word market women, it's kind of synonymous with women. When you think of market, you always think of women in, in Africa, you know, for some reason. And so women had their own personal money in Africa. They were financially independent, sorry, financially independent. They could even travel if they wanted to. Uh, like I was giving an example of the Queen of Sheba who had traveled. I didn't mention that in the beginning of today's class, but that Queen of Sheba mentioned in the Old Testament of the Bible, the reason why she's mentioned there in the first place is because she took a trip all the way from Ethiopia, Ethiopia, from Sheba, from Sheba, all the way to the Middle East to go see Solomon, to listen to his wisdom, right? Uh, and so women could travel in pre-colonial Africa. And dowry, okay, or, or what is called bride wealth was paid by the man, not by the woman. Okay, let me explain what this means. When you get married in Africa, the man would be, bring gifts to your parents, like he might bring cows or maybe yams and clothing in a suitcase or foodstuffs and or money, whatever the case may be, whatever her family is saying, you know, they should bring as gifts. Now, I don't want you to say or think, oh, they're buying the bride like a slave. Oh, uh, no, 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 no. That's what, that's not what dowry means. Dowry means you're showing respect to the parents of the bride because in pre-colonial Africa, it's an insult to just whisk a woman away to go marry without giving gifts to her parents because it's the woman that did a lot of work in the family. And now you're taking her away from her parents and they're losing her services. And so it's your way of showing respect to her parents to say, okay, I'm taking your daughter away from you, but I do respect that she means a lot to you. And so, and <clears throat> sorry, and this is my way of showing the parents that I can take care of her. She's not gonna suffer if she comes to, to live with me. I have enough wealth of my own and that's why I'm sharing some with her parents. And so it's not like, oh, he was buying the bride. No, you don't buy brides in Africa, but you do give a dowry to the parents of the bride. And so again, the bride, uh, sorry, the dowry was paid by the man. This is so important. Many people overlook this because in Europe, it's the woman who paid dowry to the guy, which is the reverse of what Africans did. Now, 
you know, you know what this means, don't you? You know where this is headed. This discussion. Anytime a woman has to pay a man to get married, that's a bad thing bad thing. That's because in Europe, typically in cultures where women pay men to be married, it means th those women have less rights. You're basically begging them to take them, to take you off your parents' hands. I mean, you don't pay a guy to get married. He should be paying to get, to get you, <laughs> you know? So, so basically in cultures where women pay, women usually have less rights and they tend to be more abused in those kind of cultures. And also there are cultures where women are seen as a burden instead of as an asset. In Africa, women are seen as an asset. And so that's why when you marry a woman in Africa, you want to show that you recognize that she's an asset to her family and you're not just taking her away just like that. And so there it is, contrary to the West, a dowry was not a sale. And I need, to, I, need, I need to say that and make sure somebody gets that. It's not a sale. So when you see on TV, people presenting, you know, cows or, you know, suitcases of clothes or money to the bride's parents, they're not trying to buy her off. No, 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 no. It was just a way to validate the legality of the union and to show that the groom can take care of his bride and showed respect to her parents. Now, one more thing about Africa that is very important that many people overlook. Did you know that even people who were slaves or servants in Africa could rise to become something else unlike in, in the West where if you were a slave and your kids were born, basically your kids were automatically slaves if you were slaves here in the, in the Americas. Well, that was not the case in Africa. Let's say for some reason there was a war and you became a POW. That's where slavery came from, really. Um, and then you became a, uh, what's it called, prisoner of war. And somebody took you as a woman and then they married you and your husband was killed in the war and then they married you. Well, they're not going to say, oh, well, because I got her in a war, I'm just going to treat her like a slave. Now, he's at, you're now his official wife. He's not going to be treating you like a slave anymore because now you're now his wife. You see what I'm saying? So in Africa, pre-colonial Africa, even slaves could rise to become somebody high than what they were when they were first, you know, when they first became slaves. So uh, and a, a very good example, I remember reading something here in this book. It's one of those old manuscript books I read. Uh, it's called Timbuktu and the Songhai Empire, which was written in about 1613. And in, in the genealogy that lists the kings, it actually lists some of the king, the mothers of kings who were former slaves. Can you imagine? And so these uh, mothers of slaves, I mean, sorry, mothers of kings were previous slaves, but then all their children were freeborn. You see, their their their, their children tr children are not automatically regarded as slaves. So then, if a king, let me give you an example. If a king marries a slave, a woman who is a slave, all those children automatically become princes. You see that? That's how we do it in Africa. It's not like here, way back, like 150 years ago, before slavery ended in the U.S., where uh, they will say. Oh, well, if your parents were slaves, well, then, then I, that automatic, automatically makes you a slave. You know, no, 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 we didn't do that, you know, in the continent. No, if your father was a king, that makes you a prince. <laughs> it's your mom who was the slave, and now she's the wife of the king. <laughs> so you see, that's the, the way the culture elevated people back in the day. So there it is. It, at the bottom, it says traditional slavery in Africa did not involve the erasure of human rights as, as was practiced here in the West. Now, I'm kind of rounding up some of this discussion. Um, we also had Black female saints. I know many people don't know about this. Uh, in Ethiopia, there was a saint called uh, Saint Walata Petros, lived in the 1500s. Uh, so here's a, a drawing of her in a book that I found. And um, so again, uh, the manuscript about her life was written like 30 years after she died. So uh, it's, it's chronicled, her life was chronicled in the, chronicled, sorry, in the official uh, chronicles of Ethiopia. So she's called Saint Walata Petros. And um, she's one of the patron saints of Ethiopia and they really revere her along with all the other saints that lived at, or that have lived. So like, well, you know how when you go to a Catholic church and you pray you know, to different saints and well, Saint Walata 
has actually, according to Ethiopians, has, has been credited with some miracles. And so in, in Ethiopia, they actually hold her in high regard. Both men and women actually do. So yes, we do have Black female saints uh, in Africa as well, in the Christian religion. Now, um, wrapping up this discussion, Women's rights actually did go down during colonization, and as I've mentioned. So the erosion of women's rights was consistent with the experience of colonization, first by Muslims, and then, of course, by Europeans. A lot of the farms that women had access to were confiscated by Europeans during colonization. And unfortunately, even after colonization ended, the lands were being given back to the men. Remember. If, uh, Europeans were very uh, chauvinist. They wouldn't let women vote till 1920. And so if they colonized a place for say like a hundred years or more, they introduced their chauvinist way of thinking into a place that that kind of thinking didn't even exist in before. And unfortunately that's what happened in Africa. A lot of chauvinists way of thinking was introduced to the continent that we didn't even have. And so, after colonization ended, obviously people could no longer be, be queens because all of that was destroyed by colonization. And then even the access to farms and land uh, were reduced. <clears throat> Sorry, so when the lands were being given back after colonization, the, the, the colonial British people gave them back to the black African men instead of, of, instead of the women. And so it shows right here, um, this helps to widen the gap between males and females, you know, men and women. And then, of course, the, uh, the colonial people introduced what was called cash crops, like cocoa, stuff you planted to export to Europe for chocolate, you know, you know stuff like that. That was mainly stuff that, whip, that men did, not women. And so the colonial masters widened the gap between men and women that wasn't there before just artificial widening of gaps. And of course, a, lo a lot of men had to go to, uh, to the cities to go, to go find jobs during the colonial times. And so the women's workloads just doubled because now the men were no longer at home to help them. And so a lot of bad things happened when African countries were colonized. That's when women lost their rights in Africa. So I need to make that um, I need to make that statement that um, actually the gap between men and women, and that's why I put an underline in case you're using it for a test. You remember that I said the gap widened during the colonial era. It was that experience that caused the er er erosion of women's rights in Africa because we, we've already established that pre-colonial women had access to political, um, you know, economic resources, financial, and so on and so forth. A lot of that was lost uh, during the colonial experience in Africa. So uh, today, uh, what, is, what, is the, what are the rights of women like? Well, women still do most of the agricultural work. It's just that they do them on less land. So they're doing a lot of work, but on limited amount of land. And since women still do 75% of our agricultural work, it means the survival, survival of Africans depend critically on women's work, even though they don't give them enough access to land like men, which means that's the reason why food production is low in Africa. The women are working very hard. However, they don't give them the technology that they need to get the work done. And so that is the reason why food production lags behind in Africa more than in other regions of the world. And uh, so again, I've, I'm mentioning here, and you can always uh, read these later. Since it's been uh, recorded, your professor would give you access to these notes. Um, right here it says uh, most of the farm aid are given to the men instead of women. And um, also, when the International Monetary Fund was introduced, uh, a lot of the programs streamlined um, things that women had access to, like government funding, uh, free things that were given to help women. So usually when you get a loan from the IMF, the first thing that they cut off are the free stuff that the government gives, healthcare, free education. Well, those are the things women need to uplift themselves out of whatever situation is happening. And unfortunately, since the 80s, 
in some countries, the inept leadership has led to the worsening of women's rights and their standard of living. However, I don't want to leave it on a downer, on a, on a sad note. It is getting better. Actually, in many parts of Africa, the gap is narrowing between males and females now. More women are going to school. In fact, in places like Rwanda, Botswana, and Lesotho, there are now more females than males in school. So that's a great, that's something wonderful to, to you know, to, to think about that it's not always so bad, you know, I don't want to leave it in a, on a bad, like, oh no, there are no women's rights, they destroyed it all. No, it's coming back. In fact, it's coming back so well that we have now produced African presidents who are women that America hasn't had yet. <laughs> and so our very first modern African president was uh, President uh, Ellen Johnson Sir Leaf of Liberia, who served two terms, and each term in Liberia is six years. They loved her so much they re-elected her again. So she served 12 years, and she stopped the war in Liberia. She was credited for stopping the war in Liberia. She got a Nobel Peace Prize for that. That's awesome. And so we've had other uh, female presidents in Africa, uh, Joyce Banda of Malawi and uh, Catherine Samba Panza of the Central African Republic. I cite examples of these women because here we are. This is the United States of America. We're supposed to be the example of democracy to the whole world. And look at us. We've never, ever produced a female president. And here is Africa. Here we are. We've produced at least three in modern times, not to talk of the queens we had in pre-colonial times that ruled in their own right, even before Europeans, right? And so, so many good things are happening in the continent. I don't want to leave it in a negative tone. So here are other good things, and then we'll round up for today. Women are agents of change in Africa. Even during the colonial times, women fought for independence in Africa, in Morocco. They would hide guns under their abayas. You know, those are things that women wear in Muslim countries, those black robes. Women used to hide AK-47s under there. <laughs> and they used to fight the French with it because French men will not pat women down during security checks. They assumed the women were harmless. Well, that was their mistake because the, the, the women had ak 47 Sevens under their abayas, and that's how they delivered guns to the guys at the front. <laughs> and so, yeah, women have been really on the fourth, uh, forefront of change in Africa. Plus, I love this woman, although she has passed away now, Professor Wangari Mathai of the Green Belt Movement in Kenya, which has planted to date about 51 million trees to make sure global warming reduces in Africa. And so actually Africa are agents, women in Africa, sorry, even today's women in the 20th century, 21st century included right now are agents of change. And so I just wanted to leave this as one of the positive things happening in the continent today, movements led by women. And so there it is, this research or presentation has uh, demonstrated that pre-colonial African women and societies were extremely advanced. And then of course, as far as women's rights were concerned, hopefully this will help to uh, correct the idea that women's, uh, women were weak, sorry, in uh, pre-colonial times in Africa or did not have any rights. Thank you all so much for your patience. Thank you for inviting me to your class. Any questions? Thank you all. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Victoria Alapo Yekomi. Um, let us give her a warm round of applause for this um, amazing presentation. Thank Wasn't you. that great? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> she pretty much summed up um, you know, our discussions from at least two weeks ago until today on women in traditional African societies. And um, I would like to open the floor now uh, for any questions or feedback about the presentation. Let's put back our mic, please, so that um, you know, our guest speaker can see who is um, you know, behind the cameras. Any questions, any comments about the presentation that um, you've just listened to? Jennifer? Or mute yourself, yes. Yes. Um, I would just like to say that it was a very good presentation. I actually learned a lot from her presentation. 
and I appreciate that she took the time to come and to um and to tell us all all about this. You're very Thank you welcome. very much. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. I know last week, um, you know, you guys had the presentation, a summary on profiles of um, historic African women, pre pre colonial um, African women. So this is more information for you in case you've not completed your summary. I'm going to make the video available so that you can um, get more information from this presentation. So moving right along, um, Lidl, do you have any questions or comments? Yeah, um, I like, yeah, I think she made a lot of good points. I learned a lot of stuff today. And um, I like I like how she's pointed out, like even during like pre-colonial time, women still have power. They held um, positions and stuff. I like how she talked about the, um, the woman whose son was king and she like, overrode the stuff with her son and like she held it down like so I liked that too so I, I like the last stuff she talked about like even in within my readings um I didn't read it yet but I, I have the book about Winnie Mandela and like even I heard she was a strong woman like her life like they, they often like connect to um Nelson Mandela which um it could be in a lot of ways but her own life her own struggle even without Mandela she still was a strong person like he still did a lot so that's good too though that's that's good too to know just like women, women was powerful with, with, in their own right. And like, in comparison to like doing pre being and like the chauvinism, like how the whole uh, woman is lowered in males and like in Africa wasn't like, like that. Like we, they, they were just as strong and they sometimes even stronger. So that was good to know. And more, more people should know about this. Like they shouldn't make them like, oh, they make like Africa is always some type of victim country. We, they are poor, they're this, but they were so much, they so much, it was so much more than that. Still is so much more than that. More people should be aware of that. You know? Thank you Thank so you much, so Liddell. Much, and I yeah, agree with yeah. you that Winnie Mandela is such a wonderful um, uh, personality to study. She really was very strong in the in the civil rights movement in South Africa, the freedom from apartheid. In fact, without her, the apartheid apartheid movement may have died after Mandela went to prison for 26 years. She was the one holding it while he was in prison because he couldn't do anything from prison himself. So, <clears throat> excuse me, she was the one helping, <clears throat> sorry, <laughs> she was the one helping to keep it going while he was in prison. Um, Nareen? Hi. Any questions or comments? Oh, um. I like we can't see you. Oh, I liked so much um so much of what we learned, especially about like the queens and the warrior queens. Yeah. Okay. They're pretty awesome. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Narin. Um Mouse. Yeah. Oh, Z Rivera, go ahead. We can't see you though. Yeah. Uh, no, nah, I just liked how you uh, were talking about all those queens that seem to have so much power and we never really truly knew about them. But um, yeah, it is very fascinating to figure out that they had so much power more than we actually thought because like everyone depicted as like, like um, old African women. And like back then, they didn't really have any power. But when we found out that they actually did and ruled kingdoms and fought in war and led armies, is very empowering for to hear. You know, such strong women were able to do such things back then, and they didn't really get held back by anything, really. Thank you so much. That that's actually a wonderful point you just made. Uh, they didn't get held back. And, and that shows that even the men in that society, they didn't feel threatened. Because usually when women are held back in a society is because the, the males, the men are feeling threatened by her um, ability to rise. Uh, in many African societies, the men don't feel threatened about the women rising. They just let you use your talents to the best of your ability. Again, remember, I'm talking about pre-colonial times now. Things started to change during the colonial times, but then it's getting better again. Thank you. Um, thank you, Z Rivera. Let's go to Miles. 
Miles, any questions or comments? On mute, please. Remember participation points, um, you know, for speaking in class. So if you're muted or your cameras are off, you're um, not going to be marked as present in class. So keep that in con into consideration. Um, let's go to Alia. Alia, questions or comments? Yes, I'm here. Wait, can you see me? Yes, we can see yes. you, Alia. Oh, because I can't see myself. Oh, okay. Um, that's what I was asking. Okay. Um, I like. I think this is the best one yet. What I've learned a lot today. I did like the picture of the woman. I think she had a gun. Yes. I think that's what. It, yes, and I just I was having a discussion with some of my coworkers because they were saying how when the Europeans came, it's like a that everybody thinks that black people they didn't have like no guns. We had pitchforks and things like that and I asked them I said where do you guys get that idea from like that's never happened that never occurred so I really did like I took a picture and I said oh. in the group chat <laughs> yeah because yeah I was like you know and then they like to portray um like black women we didn't do enough or they try to help what would I'm looking for shadow band us I guess I guess is that the word I can think of. But yeah, I did. I really enjoyed the presentation. We can have more speakers. I like this better than the actual <laughs> work. I do mean, because I learned a lot. I like this better, a lot better. Aww. Thank you. It's greatly appreciated. Thank you so much, Alia. Thank you. I really appreciated your feedback. God bless Thank you. you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. You never know. Maybe she'll come back again. Yeah. <laughs> so. Uh, Miles, you can type your question or comments in the chat. Um, he's having some tech issues. So go ahead and type it in the chat and I will read it for you. Um, he, want, he said uh, he wanted to say he loved how passionate our guest speaker was um, as listening and observing this was just as fun as it was informative. And um, his favorite part um, of the presentation was learning about how many of the women slaves in pre-colonial Africa were given opportunity to heighten their ranks. And that's from Miles. Thank you so much, Miles. That's a wonderful comment. I'm so glad that everyone felt they learned something from today's presentation. I really feel that, oh my goodness, I'm so glad I came. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all so much. You've actually made my day, actually, you know? You know, when, when, you, when you teach a class, like when I teach class and students are going like, oh, that's a nice topic. Teachers just feel like, oh yeah, kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all so much. You're very, just very generous students. I really appreciate you having me. Thank you very much for having me today. Thank you so much, Professor. Let's give her another warm round of applause Thank for you. the presentation <laughs> uh, she's made today. So the floor Thank is still um, open. We have um, a few minutes before class is over. Um, any additional comments or questions um, or feedback that any of you would like to uh, present to our guest um, speaker today? You can go ahead and unmute your mic. No questions, no comments, no feedback. Liddell. What led you to studying um, African woman and like the, and the history? What got you into studying it? Well, actually, um, I'm a geography instructor. I do dif different parts of geography. So this is just one aspect. So I don't actually um, just specialize in women's um, historical geography. So it's mostly, so that's just a branch of something I do. So not just women, <laughs> but to answer your question, what made me get into geography? I've loved geography since I was a teenager. I just always loved it in Nigeria. So when I got to college, I said to myself, well, I would like to study this as a major. In fact, my dad, our dad said, no, you can't make any money doing that. <laughs> you're just gonna, he said, you're just gonna end up being a teacher. <laughs> <laughs> Well, he, he actually predicted the teacher part, but you know what? The money isn't so bad. When you're a college professor, it's not as bad as people think. It truly isn't. No, you're not Bill Gates, but who wants a billion dollars? What are you going to use it for, right? 
<laughs> some of you are going like, yeah, I can use it. <laughs> but you know, it's not as bad as that, actually. So yeah, I, I decided to be a geographer. I love it, love teaching. I actually enjoy it. I get, get up in the morning. In fact, I was just saying last week, um, I had a class on Thursday and Wednesday. I was so excited to go to class the next day. I was going, oh, my class is tomorrow. I was actually getting excited because I was going to class. <laughs> You know, sometimes I get to class and I tell my students like a joke. I said, my show is about to begin. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and the students just crack up. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's fun. <laughs> you know, um, to add to what she said, when we were in Nigeria, you know, she's the eldest uh, sister. So and um, she used to, make, you know, her major was uh, urban geography or something like that. Yes. And to me, I, I just could not comprehend why anyone on this earth will study geography like you know some boring <laughs> stuff yes <laughs> you know so i used to think like you know she was crazy like why would you major in geography you know do something that is fun you know geography no one does that you know and um when you actually look at it everything we do is geography you know anything that yes. occurs in any particular space in time um, yes. is geography you know, so um, I'm very happy that she was able to um, come to class today and uh, make this presentation. It adds to learning about women in traditional African societies, because remember at the beginning of class, I said, I didn't want us to start um, this class with women from slavery until present day. I wanted us to learn about women in traditional African societies where it all started, you know, black women in Africa before uh, the transatlantic slave trade to understand um, some of the roles of women in traditional African societies, to understand, um, you know, their rights, to understand their contributions, to understand, you know, how they were viewed, how they were portrayed. So I'm very glad that um, you were able to make that presentation um, to us today. And again, I'm going to um, make this video um, available once it's ready um, later tonight. I will post it on the week five um, Blackboard announcement page. And remember, um, you guys have a lot of work to catch up on. I don't see any discussions happening on Blackboard. And this is the absolute last week that I'm going to accept any work. And the reason why I'm giving the opportunity for you to complete your work is because of our guest speaker. I want you to be able to add part of her presentation to the work that is due. So you have the entire week. Today is only Monday. And, you know, we don't meet up on Wednesday. The class is actually on Mondays and Wednesday. But um, on Wednesday, I give you off so that you can catch up on your work. And if by this Sunday, October 3rd at 11.30 p.m., um, you don't post on Blackboard uh, participation, um, you know, the questions that um, need responses and also responding to two people and working on your um, response papers and posting in the appropriate um, uh, assignment folder. I'm not going to accept any work again. So you have exactly one week to complete week one to six work. And the video by Professor uh, Victoria is also going to be available. So some of the notes, I don't know if um, we're able to save your presentation into a PDF format and maybe make that available for students or you can okay. just watch it on the um, Zoom link or I'm going to make a request um, if we're able to save it in PDF and okay. uh, post it on the Blackboard so that students can review that as well. All right. All right. So. All right. Thank you so much. Are there any last minute questions or comments before we go into office hours? Are there any comments, feedback, um, you know, for the guest speaker today? All right. So let's give another warm round of applause and show Thank our appreciation for her so coming much. out to, I mean, coming out um, to make the presentation in, on women in traditional African societies, women in pre-colonial Africa. Thank you so much, Professor um, Yemi Alako Yekomi for visiting us today from Metro Community College in Omaha, Nebraska. 
Thank you so much. God bless. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you. you. Have a wonderful rest of your semester. Thank, Thank you, you all. So and God much. bless you. Bye-bye.